As uh, you know, Bobby was down here saying, I had seven flats in one day. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't, I mean, I don't know. I mean, we were just talking about it. And, uh, you know, some of the things that other missionaries, like right now, if you guys know um, Sherry and uh, Hayes, um, oh my gosh, my mind just went blank. Joe, Joe ha uh, Hayden. Hayden. You know, Joe Hayden, if you guys have been keeping up with them from Decatur, They've only been in the country of Zambia for a year now. They got their car broken into, everything was stolen. Now they've just recently had their house broken into, everything was stolen. And just a few months ago, his wife was driving and hit a cow and rolled the car. And she was almost killed, really. I mean, she's okay, and she had to wear a neck brace. But, and and the re please pray for them, okay? But the reason I bring it up is because it's interesting how God takes people on a mission field and might be at the same place, but goes through different experiences. You listened to Bobby's testimony last night. I'm looking forward to You guys should sit down and get the whole scoop because it's just amazing. 17 bouts of malaria, right? 17, never had one bout myself. You know, I don't know why. I, there's just as many mosquitoes there now as there was then. But you know what? God saw fit not to allow that to happen to us, and that's fine, you know. Um, but yes, uh, you know, the... God watched over us and he protected us while we were there. And I'm so thankful for that. And he just chose to do it in the way that he did. And so I know it wasn't easy for my wife to get up here and share these things. And, um, hon, I love you. And thank you for uh, submitting to the Lord. Amen. Yeah. You know, I mean, I wouldn't be able to do the things that I do. I mean, she, I think I can say this. All, all, all you wives make your husbands look so good. You really do. There's the things that... She had to walk through over there. Wow, I, I, I just, I, I couldn't even share them with you, the things that God allowed my wife to walk through. But I know she's a stronger woman now. And I know that she's closer to her Lord because of it. And so with that, um, I'm just going to share a little bit from my side, what it was like when we went over there. When we got there, so a few things we did. Most of you all have seen um, on our, on, on, on what we've sent you on our newsletters, all the details and on Facebook of things we've done. So I won't go into a lot of detail, but what I want to share with you is how God is now bringing us back here. Okay. And so, um, when we left, uh, four years ago, and like Tammy said, it's more of a six year adventure from the time it really all started. Um, God really laid upon our heart a threefold plan. And I shared that with you. It was our threefold priority, and our priorities were um, to encourage and edify the already established works that were there, that Bobby had established, John and Kevin Petsky, Randy Foster, all these missionaries that had taken part. We were like the Paul the Apostle on the third, his third trip, just to go strengthen the brethren, right? But we also had uh, the obvious ones, evangelism and discipleship. That's very, very important. You want to see people come to know Christ, and then you want to perfect them, that they might grow up in the Lord, and that they too might even get called out and go plant some churches. Well, that was the third piece. The third piece was to establish pastors' training centers. And you know what? Praise the Lord. By the time we got there, boom, we got on the ground, October 13, 2016, and we hit the ground running. I remember my first Sunday there. I'm in a tie. I'm getting ready to preach, and I'm up on a ladder spraying to get rid of the bees out of my house. You know, and that's my first Sunday. They were just welcoming me. That was their way of welcoming us, you know. They came into our home, and, and that was something that we dealt with all the time. It was no big deal. But from that point, we started going and traveling from district to district, church to church, sharing the gospel, and, and just slowly getting our feet wet, slowly getting involved. And uh, shortly after that, as many of you know, the um, organization came and asked me to be the head missionary and the director of ministries. And through much prayer, we accepted that. I, I accepted that and moved forward with it. But again, I had no plans on doing that. That was not my plan. When I got there, John Sarah was a head missionary, and I was just planning on being a spoke on the wheel and moving forward. But as a man's heart directed his way, the Lord, or as a man's heart devises his way, the Lord directed his steps. And God had different plans. And so we ventured into this, and it, it, it was a huge responsibility. And m much more than just even one man could handle, honestly. And it, it was all about a team, having the right people, the right place, the right time, all working together. And John was, you know, John's health was diminishing. But he was, af he was at it. He was hard at it. Um, you know, he reminds me of an Elijah type of guy. Just, he's probably the toughest man I've ever met in my life. 
the toughest. I mean physical. Uh, I seen him out doing something, and a, and a, a metal splinter goes in his hand, and he just spits on it and goes right back to work, you know? That's the type of guy he was. But yet, he loved Jesus. He knew the word. He loved to teach God's word, and he kept hard at it. So with that, we started working together just to continue to move forward. And, and as many of you all saw on a lot of our posts, you know, we eventually, even that first year, 2017, um, the first full year, we had uh, MCBC, a church up north, came in to do a, a teacher's training seminar. And then you all came the end of 2017. And we started having teams come in and just doing what Kafula Futa has always been doing, ministering to the people and investing the way we always have. But God started changing a few things. And um, one thing he allowed us to do was to take our discipleship lessons and have them um, um, translated into a few different languages. We started a discipleship program, or not want to leave what program, but we went into each district and started teaching the philosophy, giving them the tools to be able to start discipling. And to this day, there are some churches that are still hard at it. There are some that aren't, and that's okay. But yet we started implementing this. At the end of 2017, God showed me that one thing about many of the churches that they were unhealthy. And so we started what we call the restoration ministry. And we went in and we started teaching them from Acts chapter 2 how they can look at their church, find out where they're at, and really start building them back up to a place of health. We started a restoration ministry. They had restoration pastors. And Pastor Alex Chippy is one of those pastors. And what we would do is we would pray about it and ask God to lead some of these men to a church that doesn't have a pastor and help restore them back to a place of health. We've got three or four pastors doing that right now. And it's a long-term ministry. It doesn't happen overnight. You're talking three years down the road. But it's something that God laid on our heart, and that's what we've been doing. Evangelism, discipleship, restoration ministry, and then just the everyday work that would take place over there. And in 2018, I was driving with Pastor Elijah Pula, and he starts sharing with me that He's, he was young, he was in his 50s, he's getting ready to retire, and he said, you know what, Brian, I just really, I really feel like God wants in my life just to give 100% to him. I'm getting ready to retire after 30 years, I still got much time, I just don't know what God wants me to do. And I thought that was interesting because God started dealing in my heart because one thing I realized is exactly the same thing that Bobby said last night, is that if Zambia is going to be reached, it's going to be reached by Zambians. You know, here's the thing. You and I, we can go in with the Word of God and we can teach people from different uh, uh, cultures and backgrounds Scripture. We can do that. That's great. But one thing, I don't care how long you're there, you'll never truly understand the depths of the culture and what they deal with. How many of you today had to deal with witchcraft in your life? That's something that <laughs> all of us, really, if you think about it, right? Amen? Rebellion, is that what you're saying? Rebellion? But, but we see, that's something we don't have to deal with on a daily basis. We don't really see it. It's here, it's just masked differently, right? Over there, this is something that people deal with. I was at a funeral right before I came over, and I had the opportunity to preach at this funeral. Everything was interpreted in English except for one thing, and I don't know if it was done on purpose. But here's the thing, the man, uh, the woman who de deceased, Pastor Makanta's wife, the man gets up and he starts thanking everybody in his own tongue about, you know, everybody coming and helping. But he also gave a warning. He said, if any of you had anything to do with the death of my, I think it was his sister, then you're going to have to answer for it. And he said more about that, but what he was talking was witchcraft. He was saying, if any of you had anything to do with bringing a hex or some juju on my sister, you know, you're going to pay for it. And see, here's the thing. We obviously know, well, I can't say it doesn't happen because it happens. But yet at the same time, here's the problem. A lot of the times they make the witch doctor this big, but they make God this big, you see. No matter how much you make God this big, they make the witch doctor, or they make God this big in the witch doctor. See, these are the things we're dealing with. And I can take you in scripture and help you with that, but I can't understand the depths and, of, of, of the stronghold that it has, okay? So, so God started laying these things on my heart, and he started showing me that Elijah Pooley was a man who'd been trained up under Bobby Bonner, and now God has grown him into a place. And I remember him telling me he had such a passion and a desire to reach the people of his country and to help the pastors who were in need. 
because the pastors needed help from somebody who could understand them. They have a hard time coming to me because I can't understand them, especially after four years. And John being there for 20 plus, she being there for 18 plus, you know what? They would come to him, these men, because they were the founders of the mission. But yet even they, in so many ways, couldn't understand. So God started sharing to me. He said, Brian, you know, um, this is the man I want you to ask to be the director of ministries. And so this was my thought. Okay, and, and this is something right before I left, probably about two weeks before we came back in 2019, I sat Pastor Elijah Pooley down and I said, look, I really believe God is doing something in your life and he's doing something in the life of Kafula Futa. He's doing something in my life. Because see, what God has shown me, he's saying, Brian, here's what I want you to do. I want you to give the old ministry. And that's not a negative context. It's just the best way I can describe it. I want you to give that over to Pastor Elijah Pooley because he can understand. He can understand how to reach his own people. So when it comes to um, when it comes to pastor's training, when it comes to women's ministry, when it comes to the deaf and all this, to turn that over to him and let him be the director of ministries. And then what I was going to do was come back from furlough and I was going to focus on the youth and I was going to focus on pastor's training, what I felt God had called me there to do. See, when I got there, God redirected my heart. No longer, he, he allowed me to do the first two priorities, but the third priority of pastor's training, he put that on hold. He said, Brian, not now. There's other things you got to take care of. And that's when he started showing me the, 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 how unhealthy some of our churches were. As time went on, like I just told you, I was like, Pastor Pooley, I would love to see you take this role when I get back. And you know what? He called me back and says, yes, God made it clear. And I'm like, praise the Lord. I was so excited because I'm like, here's a man that has the mindset, the heart set, and the life set to be able to reach his own people. It was time. I was excited. I'm like, this is what it's about. Now, here's the thing. I told you my three priorities, but we had some underlying priorities, some small priorities that and we never really shared, and one of them was getting Kafula Futa and GCMS to the place of self-sustaining. That was something God laid on my heart a long time ago. I know it was something that was on this man's heart. I know it was something on the other man's heart by the name of John Sarah, but it just would never was the time. And so that was one of my smaller priorities that I had talked with pastor. We got together and said, well, these are our, our major priorities, but these are some more we're going to be praying about. Well, I thought, man, praise God. God's doing it in steps, and this is going to happen. I can turn this over. I can come back. That was my plan. And like my wife said, we had a plan, right? We had a plan. Plans are good. They're not a bad thing. Plans are good. So we get back, like Miss Tammy said, we come back for, for our first furlough. And then Miss Tammy has, uh, I'm so used to saying Miss Tammy, only because that's how we say people over there, Miss Lorna, Miss Tammy. But, um, and then she had her strokes in December. And, uh, and again, like I said, that did, I think I said that the other night, that's not what deterred us. We were still looking at going direction of, uh, of going back, even with that. And I remember God gave me a verse, and I want to read this verse to you real quick. It's the last chapter of Deuteronomy. And it's about uh, the life of Moses. And it says here in Deuteronomy, chapter 34, verse 7, it says, And Moses was 120 years old when he died. His eyes was not dim, nor his natural force abated. He still had vision and he had strength. You see, he could have he kept going. He didn't die because he was weak. He didn't die because his health failed him. He died because it was time for his death, you see. And so when I read that, I thought, wow, that kind of connects to where we're at right now. And what I mean by that is, is we weren't going to allow Tammy's health to hold us back from doing what God wanted us to do. I mean, I had to look at it this way. Are we going to definitely go and then you're going to have to show us to stay? Or are we definitely going to stay and you're going to have to show us to go? That was difficult for me to try to figure that out, but we were always 100% committed. And you know that even the doctor said, look, you can still go if they have the right medications. And so we, our decision of coming back is not because of Tammy's health. Our decision of coming back is this. It's one thing, because it's the right time. It's God's time. It's what God told us to do. There's that uh, up there when we were singing, I think it says, give me faith to trust what you say. Wow, that hit me hard tonight. I was told a long time ago 
Brian, there might be a time in your walk with God where you're going to have to stand on an island alone with just him. And he's going to tell you to do something that nobody else is going to understand. And I, ha- I hit that place. And I don't say it uh, in a negative sense towards anybody here. But I remember even going to those I know and saying, I think God is doing this. I think God is, is really wanting us to turn this ministry over. And they're like, it's not going to happen. I, I, it, and you know what? I had to finally, God gave me and said, look, look, I'm not responsible for the outcome. I'm just responsible for my obedience. And so God showed us little by little, step by step, 2020, through all the craziness, that it was time to come back. And I remember sitting with my pastor over here. And, uh, and I couldn't even say the words. I was sitting in his office, and, and I said, you know, I, I, I think I know what I'm supposed to do. I, what am I supposed to do? I think I said that. What am I, it was almost like I just wanted someone to tell me what I was supposed to do. And God used our pastor to say, Brian, I think you already know what you're supposed to do. And it was at that moment that I said it with my mouth for the first time out loud that God was calling us home. You know, doing what's right because it's the right thing to do is not the easiest thing to do in the world. Because here's the thing. I had to have a conversation with Pastor Poulet on the phone, and I had to say, look, I don't think God's just calling you to be the director of ministries. God is calling you to lead this ministry. I I had the opportunity to talk to Pastor Alex and Pastor Poulet on the phone at the same time and share everything that I'm sharing with you, I share with Pastor Poulet. And you know what he said? Let me pray about it. <laughs> I've got to pray about this. And you know what? Praise God. God was working in his life and his heart. He came back and said, no, I believe that this is what God is doing. So when I went back the last time, I had to sit down with the board and explain to them the exact same thing that I'm explaining to you. And they were all excited. It was the first time Bobby was there to help start the ministry. John continued the ministry. Kevin Petsky was the man who came and actually helped turn the executive board from American to nationals so that they were leading it. And now God is allowing us to be a part of something so special to actually turn this ministry over to the nationals. And when I told them that, they're all so excited about it. They just, they're looking forward to it. I know there's some fear there. Because there's always been a Mzungu in charge, the white guy. But you know what? They need to know that they can do this in Christ. They need to know that they can do this through the Spirit of God. Amen? Amen? And before I came back, I I only told, other than Alex, Alex and Crystal, they're just, they're a unique couple, right? They have the, they, they earn the right to know everything at the moment, well, almost at the moment's notice. And so I sat down with uh, Pule. And I sat down with Pastor Andrew Malenga, and I shared with them, and I said, guys, look, and this is one thing Pule kept saying. He'd say, Brian, um, one thing is, is Brian's sharing this with us, but he hasn't shared with us his vision for what he's going to be doing. He noticed that. He picked up on that. And I had to share with him that last week that we weren't coming back. It was the hardest thing I had to do. I sat there and I did not believe I was going to cry, but I wept in front of them because let me tell you, coming back is even harder than going there because that's where my heart is. That's where God broke my heart and gave me a heart for people that I didn't even know. So for him to say, Brian, it's time, you're finished, you need to come back, that was the hardest thing. And that's why I was saying doing what's right is the hardest thing to do because I had to sit down with my wife and I had to look at her in her eye and say, "Hun, I know we just moved our family 8,000 miles, but now we've got to come back because God is telling me to. And I had to sit down with Pule and say, Pule, I love you. I love you guys, but God is calling us away. And, and we were all crying. We we're all sitting there just tearing up and crying because it was difficult. But it was a cry of rejoicing at the same time because that which God laid on my heart, that's what he laid on my heart a long time ago. I get to see come to fruition. There are things that God laid on your heart probably 30 years ago that's happening right now. That's something to be excited about. That's something to be thankful for. But I also want to let you guys know, and it's 8.15, we'll be getting into the message soon. (laughs) It's an all-nighter. Nobody's near any windows, right? You're going to fall out. But, uh, so, but here's the thing, and I'll close out the testimony with this, is that 
One thing God has laid on my heart is, is, you, is exactly what your pastor is telling you. He says that he wants us to continue invest in Kafula Futa to be a shot in the arm for Pastor Pule and the organization. Praise God for that. And that tells you that we're not abandoning this ministry. There's no abandonment taking place. This is something that we really, I really feel like we can do more from this side of the lake than we can from that side because they know the word. They know the word better than most of us here, better than me. They know how to reach their own people. They don't need me there for that. But what we can do is be a support from this side for them over there. And so one thing we've talked about is um, even after I move back, I'm remaining on the GCMS executive board. You see, because why? The world's this big with technology. I can just get on a phone and be right there with them to help advise and direct and guide financially in many different ways. So I'm still going to be active. I'm still going to be involved. Prayerfully, I'm still going to be talking to churches and however it might work, churches that we're connected with, to have teams still go back over there. You know, Pastor Pule, GCMS, doesn't just need a shot of financial support. They need a shot of church support. We still need to send teams over there to encourage them. This is the time where they need the encouragement the most. Amen? So that's exactly why what God has laid on my heart to share with you all. I know it went a little bit longer than normal, and I'm sorry about that, but there's still so much to share, and trying to get it done in a short period of time is very difficult. But you know, we wouldn't be able to do it without you. Like my wife said, we, there never was a day that we went wanting. We ask that you never forget us going over, and you didn't do that. You prayed for us. You financially supported us. You sent teams over to engage with us and the people You guys did exactly what the church was supposed to do. I mean, I've never seen nothing like it before. The way you rallied around us, behind us, to help us is something amazing. And I'm just prayerfully asking that we continue to do so. I have no doubt that eventually this church is going to send out another missionary. It's going to send out another pastor. We're going to plant some churches because that's what we're supposed to do. And we need to get behind whoever it is in order to do so. Because God has called us to the mission field to reach other places, even across the road, across the state, across the country, across the world. Amen? So thank you very much for everything you've done for us. We couldn't have done it without you. And man, we love you so much. You're my family. Amen?